You are locked in on the Stingray Show, and coming up on this edition, we are going to talk all things Alabama basketball with a former player and head coach for the University of Alabama. He played at the university from 1984 through 1987, and then was the head coach from 1998 through 2009. I'm talking about Alabama head coach Mark Godfrey will join us on this edition of the Stingray Show. We've got a lot to cover, so let's get things rocking and rolling. Hi, this is Tim Brando with a reminder. Those of you on Tide 100.9, look out. You're about to feel the buzz of Stingray. This is Stephen Ray, a.k.a. Stingray. Coming to you live from Tuscaloosa, Alabama. I'm Heath Hopkins. I'm here in DeSoto County, Mississippi, right outside of Memphis, Tennessee. You know, Mark, I, I'm going to put you on the spot. Do you feel that responsibility to pay it forward and give some kid a chance coming up in the ranks, kind of like Tony did for you? Why do you think I'm talking to Stingray tonight? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, man. I appreciate no, that. No, I'm going to look. No. Hey, Stingray, here's the deal. When you get involved with Texas, it's like getting married to a stripper. <laughs> <laughs> and, and let me explain this. It looks good, it's kind of sexy on, on the surface, yeah. But then you get the baggage, you get the drama, you get all that eventually comes with it. And that's what you get with Texas, and that's what the Big 12 learned. And Heath, any thoughts on our show moving forward? Hey, to everyone in Tuscaloosa listening here on Tide 100.9, with the Stingray Show, if you don't like it, you better learn to love it because it's the best show going today, baby. Woo! Strange Brew Coffee House continues to roll out brand new drinks, including the Yosemite, which is white chocolate and roasted marshmallow. Doesn't that sound amazing? You can find Strange Brew at 1101 University Boulevard right there on the strip at the University of Alabama campus. And hey, did you know that you can get Strange Brew delivered to your door? Check out strangebrewcoffeehouse.com for all the Strange Brew's bags of coffee, K-Cup, mugs, shirts, and a whole lot more right there at strangebrewcoffeehouse.com. And Heath, with all of that, we want to welcome you inside another edition of the Stingray Show. And Heath, I'm just going to go ahead and say it. This episode is going to be electric. Yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. You know, for all of our SEC fans, uh, you will remember the name. But of course, we're here on Tide 100.9 and everybody will remember the name. Yes. So I also forgot to mention he had a coaching stop as well at Murray State and at North Carolina State after his tenure at Alabama. And he was the SEC regular season champion back in the year of 2002 and also that year the SEC coach of the year. Ladies and gentlemen, please help us welcome to the Stingray Show, Mr. Mark Godfrey. Coach, how are you doing, sir? I'm doing absolutely wonderful out here in Newport Beach, California, so I can't complain. So, Coach, how far are you from the beach? Are you are you oceanfront? Are you down the street? Are you close by? I'm about two miles. I can get it. I can go out my front door and walk it in about, uh, you know, 30 minutes, and I'm right down there on the beach and sitting on the sand, so it's not bad. Beautiful. That's well, I've awesome. seen the beaches there in Newport, and they are beautiful. So, well, Coach, thank you for coming on the show. Uh, I'm sure we've got so many questions uh, that we want to throw at you, so we'll try to get them going now uh, before we run out of time. But when you think back to your time in Tuscaloosa, what's the one thing that you miss the most? Is it a restaurant? Is it the folks? What is it? Well, it's always people more than anything for me. I had great friends there. You know, you have to remember – you know, I, I spent college years in Tuscaloosa and then spent a lot mm-hmm. there, you know, as an adult. And, uh, you know, my kids went to American Academy. They loved uh, the school. It was great. Um, we we enjoyed it. I love Tuscaloosa. We lived out on the lake uh, in uh, Crown Point. Yeah. It was beautiful. So, anyway, I, I miss the people. Great restaurants. And I loved being a part of the University of Alabama. But I think the people, uh, they treated me so well there uh, through all those years. I, I could never complain about that. Yes, sir. Wow. 
So, Coach, let's go back to your playing career. You played one season at Oral Roberts before transferring to Alabama in 1984. What ultimately made you decide to transfer to Alabama? Well, you know, coming out of high school, uh, you know, Coach Sanderson had recruited me and Sonny Smith at Auburn at that time. And, uh, you know, Alabama had Enos Watley. He was a freshman. Enos was a great player. And so, you know, even though Alabama recruited me, I was down in Mobile. They, you know, it was kind of a half-hearted effort. Not not the, you know, they had their guy. And and so mm -hmm. I chose to go to Oral Roberts only because of the coach that was there. I had a great relationship with him. But when I was out there, you know, I realized, you know, I had worked my whole life to be a really good basketball player, and I wanted to play at the highest level. And at the same time, Enos Watley had put his name in the draft and uh, Alabama needed, you know, they, they were in need then. They had a, a bigger need for me. And mm -hmm. so uh, Coach Sanderson did a great job and he flew out to Tulsa. And, you know, we laughed about it. Uh, we've laughed many times, you know. He, he got in a hotel out there and said, I'm not leaving until you sign. And so he actually <laughs> had the papers and he came over in a taxi cab and we, we uh, he put the papers on top of the cab. I signed it and there we go. I'm heading to Alabama. So, it all turned out really well, and uh, I just loved every minute of it. So, Coach, a quick follow-up to that. What are some of your fondest memories of playing for the Crimson Tide from 1984 through 1987? Well, we had so much success. You know, we, we went to three straight Sweet 16s as a player uh, during that stretch, and um, Coach Sanderson was doing such an amazing – SEC championship in 87 round and we won the uh, SEC tournament champions. We were double champions that year, but uh, you know, my roommate, Jim Farmer and I, we've stayed really close. We probably talk once a week. Uh, we see each other all the time and guys like Derek McKee and Keith Askins and Terry Connor and JJ Jackson. We just had a, a really great group of guys that honestly weren't rooted and uh, we just uh, became really good as a team. And we had great, great success and great runs. We're still disappointed that we didn't get past the Sweet 16. They thought we were good enough to, to go to the Final Four. Uh, you know, we entered the tournament as a two seed, got to play at Birmingham those first two games. So uh, it was a lot of fun. I think what we all still look back and we all are kind of trying to figure out why we didn't get past Providence back in 87 and, and make it to the Final Four. Coach, what in the world was Tuscaloosa like back in the mid '80s as a college student? <laughs> it was a lot of fun, I can tell you that. Uh, <laughs> I'm you sure know, you're glad social media uh, wasn't around know, too, right? <laughs> you know, it was it was a lot simpler, probably a lot smaller. You know, the uh, the restaurants and bars for college kids down there in Gillette's and the Brass Monkey, and you know, all those <laughs> kind of uh, places. Uh, they were a lot of fun and. But, you know, when you're an athlete, a lot of times, you know, you, you don't have the, the free time that the, the normal student does. And so we were right. tied up a lot. And, uh, you know, it was, it was a different experience. But, um, you know, we lived in Bryant Hall. Uh, people forget that back then, you know, with the athletic dorm, which is now the academic uh, center, they've done a great job. It's beautiful. But, you know, we lived with the football players and the basketball players. And uh, some of those guys, what was so nice about that is they became – great friends. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we got to know those guys. We ate every meal, breakfast, lunch, dinner, and a late night snack all in Bryant Hall. And so we were, we were kind of confined to that, that building. And uh, even though that was interesting, it was a lot of fun, you know, guys that Mike Shula, uh, you know, was down the hall yeah. for four years and we got to be great friends and West neighbors and Preston Gothard. And I can go through, there's, there's 40 of those guys like that in that era. And that was kind of fun, getting to know uh, the basketball, the football players uh, all mm -hmm. together. But I had a great, great experience there as a student athlete. It was just wonderful. Coach, looking back at your playing career, what is the biggest highlight that you still enjoy looking back and smiling about? Probably, um, you know, winning the SEC championship as a player. I, I think that was just that league is such a great league. And here's what happens, mm -hmm. I think, even at Alabama. And people love basketball there. And, uh, you know, football is always going to be king. We all, we all understand that. But, you know, C.M. Newton had won a uh, SEC championship. I think it was 74. Um, we won it in 87 as a player. 
And then when I coached there in 2002, we won it. And there was a stretch over about a 40 year period where there was only three SEC championships. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people think, you know, a lot of times Alabama basketball has won more than that. And we really haven't. And so to win those championships, you know, I was able to do it as a player and then as a coach as well, just hasn't been done a ton at Alabama, mm -hmm. even though Alabama has great teams and great players. That league is such a good league, and it's such a balanced league that uh, it's very, very difficult to do. So I think as a player, when you play on that championship, you get to cut the nets down. Yeah, uh, We had beaten Florida for the SEC championship uh, late in the season there and clinched it, and uh, that was just a lot of fun. Yes. Wow. So, Coach, hold that thought because we are up against our first break, and when we come back, we are going to dive into – your head coaching time at Alabama. That's on the other side of the break. You're listening to the Stingray Show. We will be right back. Residents of Tuscaloosa, are you guys upsizing, downsizing, looking for college housing, or even relocating for your job right here to Tuscaloosa? If that's the case, then you need to contact Celeste Hagler, owner and operator of First Class Real Estate South Home Group. She can help you with the buying, selling, and investment needs throughout the state of Alabama. You can contact Celeste at 205-861-5698. Reach out to Celeste again at 205-861-5698 and schedule a consultation to discuss your real estate goals and to live where you love in the state of Alabama. Welcome back inside the Sting Ray Show. Our guest this evening is former Alabama head coach Mark Godfrey. And coach, after college, you became the head coach of Murray State for three seasons before being hired by Alabama on March the 25th of 1998. What was that hiring process like? And if you would, please walk us through that entire process. So when I was coaching at Murray State, first of all, it was a great place for me to start as a head coach. You know, I, I got to learn how to be a head coach and I got to make mistakes mm -hmm. and the whole world wasn't watching. And right. I think sometimes that happens to coaches uh, where they get thrown into the to the lion's den and, and uh, you know, all of a sudden all eyes are on them. So I had a great three years at Murray State. A lot of people don't remember or don't realize that after my second year at Murray State, both Tennessee and Georgia uh, both opened that year. And I had a feeling that Alabama potentially could could become open the following year. Dave Hobbs, who I played for as an, he was an assistant for Wimp Sanderson, their teams were good, but there was a lot of talk that, you know, that job could potentially open. Mm -hmm. So I actually turned down the Tennessee job and the Georgia job waiting one more year for the Alabama job. And uh, it was an interesting process. Bob Bockrath was the AD at the time. Mal Moore was the associate AD. And, uh, you know, Bob and I had a good relationship, but it was kind of a back and forth. You know, he kind of came after me, but he didn't really come very hard. And uh, I was a little disappointed. Uh, you know, it wasn't my alma mater, and our teams were doing really well at uh, Murray State. But it all worked out. And uh, I was glad I took the job. I was glad I had the opportunity to come back to Alabama as a head coach. That was such a thrill and an honor for me, having played at Alabama, than to be the coach there. Right. So it just, uh, the process was, it was interesting. And, um, you know, I thought a lot about taking the Georgia job and the Tennessee job that, that second year at Murray State. But I just felt in my heart I wanted to uh, wait and see if Alabama were to open, and it did. And so... It all worked out pretty well. So, Coach, a quick follow-up to that. Your first game as coach of Alabama was against Ohio State. What do you remember most about that first game as coach of your alma mater? Well, I can remember that I was actually hoping my first game was going to be against somebody like Grambling or something. <laughs> 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 we had to go on the road to Ohio State. Yes. Not only that, uh, Ohio State had played for about 50 years in this old arena called St. John's Arena, and they were opening up 
uh, th- this brand new, beautiful arena. So we were the first game, you know, and the, wow. the place was electric. And, you know, you're kind of walking in saying, what did I get myself into here? Yes. And, you know, that first year when I was there, uh, you know, we inherited a, a group of guys that, you know, they were they were fun to coach, but probably our talent level wasn't, you know, where we needed it to be. And it was going to take a couple of years to, to recruit and then, you know, grow up some young players and uh, get them ready. So we kind of, you know, the game was a good game. It was a competitive game. We didn't win, but I just remember uh, we're not really ready for this one just yet. But, uh, you know, those games always help you in the end, and it was a lot of fun. Coach, you were talking about the mistakes that you made at Murray State. Not everyone's watching. You know, for our, our young audience, the, the college students are out there, or even the young adults or folks still moving up the ladder in the working world. Can you talk about those kind of mistakes? Of Because I'm sure a lot of people are wondering, like, what kind of mistakes are you making as a first-year head coach? Or, you know, how did you overcome those? Because I, I love the Dave, uh, Dave Ramsey quote, successful people stand on top of their problems instead of being buried by them. And you clearly were successful. So talk about those mistakes and how you overcame them and what mistakes th- uh, those were. Well, I think when you're when you're beginning to be a head coach, first of all, it's a lot different than being an assistant coach. And, mm. uh, you know, it's a it's a lonely position, to be quite honest. You know, that when you're an assistant, you got some peers and, and you know, other assistants you can kind of talk to a lot and bounce things off of. When you're a head coach, you're, sometimes you're sitting there, it's a little bit lonely. Mm. But I remember going to Murray State and, you know, it's hiring a staff. And am I hiring the right people? Am I looking for the right things? Uh, Some of the recruiting decisions that you make in game situations, you know, you're coaching a game and, and you feel like, boy, you know, you're in a tough situation and you have to make a decision. And then you go home late at night thinking, boy, you know, I don't know if I made the right call. I I should have done this instead of that. And so you're constantly, it, it was almost a great training ground for me to be prepared then to go to the SEC. And so there are so many things that come into becoming a head coach. And uh, you just have to learn a little bit some of those things. And then over time, uh, you, you know, you all of a sudden you're in an in-game situation and there's a timeout or there's a play to be called or you're switching defenses or an out-of-bounds play, whatever it might be. And you're a lot more comfortable having done those things for me at Murray State because – like I said, there were a lot of times I felt, boy, I might have screwed this up, or I didn't do, I didn't make the right decision, or hiring a, a coaching staff, and right. you know maybe I put emphasis on the wrong things. And what I've always felt like is coaches, when they become head coaches, it's good to have, you know, those years like I did under my belt because I felt so much more prepared to mm-hmm. go to Alabama than I would have if I had just gone straight from UCLA as an assistant coach to a job like Alabama, which is a pretty big job. So I thought those years were just really good for me. You know, Coach, you talked about your time at UCLA. I was going to ask you about uh, working with Coach Jim Herrick. I was a big fan of Jim Herrick. And also you you worked with uh, uh, Coach Levin. And, you know, he went on to do some fun things and great things as well. But what did Coach Herrick teach you? Uh, what was that like working on that stuff under him? Well, I've always said, you know, Jim Herrick, and, and he just, I, you know, I've got a podcast, obviously. He was, he's, I just released a uh, episode with Jim, and he was really, really good. And, you know, he talked about, you know, some of the mistakes he's made, obviously, over a career. But, uh, you know, you, you look back with no regrets, and, and mm-hmm. all in all, all things are good. But Jim was such a good teacher. You know, Jim started off, uh, Coach Herrick, you know, nine years in high school, at Morningside High School here in Los Angeles before he became uh, an assistant coach in college. And then he went to Pepperdine and, and kind of cut his teeth before UCLA. So with his, with his teaching background, you know, he sat in the classroom, he taught English for nine years. Hmm. And so his, his methods of coaching and building a practice plan and minute by minute and all the things you want to mm-hmm. cover and being prepared, um, I always thought he was really good at that. And those were a, a lot of things I, I carried over throughout the years and how I planned my practices and things that we ran offensively or defensively. And um, I was able to, to be at UCLA seven years and, you know, watch him be the head coach, you know, obviously help him and recruit and coach. But I learned such a great deal from him. And then the other thing that happened was when I was at UCLA, I had the amazing privilege and opportunity to spend unlimited time hanging out with coach John Wooden, you know, who won 10 national Mm -hmm. championships back in the, in the seventies. 
And so I just was, uh, those, they're, they're kind of the formative years, you know, you're learning how to coach, how do I want to coach? What do we want to do? You know, what do I want my program to look like? And, uh, I was able to be around two guys that had been very, very successful in that regard. Then obviously Wimp Sanderson, I, my, mm-hmm. my time with coach Sanderson at Alabama was unreal. He was such mm-hmm. a good coach. I think he nationally was underappreciated for the success he had. And uh, so anyway, I was I was able to just to spend time around some really good, uh, successful coaches. And that really helped me. Citizens of West Alabama, have you heard the news? The Bank of Moundville, which was established way back in 1907, offers personal loans of all sizes, unsecured and secured with competitive interest rates. You can contact them today at 205-371-2227. Once again, that is the Bank of Moundville, 205-371-2227, or go by and see them in downtown Moundville, they are an equal housing lender and a member of the FDIC. So coach, hold that thought because we are up against another break and when we come back we are going to continue to dive into your coaching career at Alabama. That's on the other side of the break. You're listening to the Stingray Show. We will be right back. Welcome back inside the Stingray Show. Our guest this evening is Mark Godfrey, the former Alabama and NC State basketball coach and coach. Later in the season, your first season at Alabama, your team knocked off number five Kentucky here in Tuscaloosa, 62-58. to What do you remember most from that huge upset win versus Kentucky? You know, our team was was not a great team that year, but we had really good guys that wanted to, you know, they wanted to to win. They had struggled a little bit uh, before I got there. And, you know, we were good enough on one night to beat a Kentucky that we might lose an Ole Miss by, you know, it was up and down like a yo-yo that year. But I remember late in the game, Sam Haganis from uh, UMS Prep down in Mobile, he had a big steal and a big dunk kind of sealed the, sealed the win there for us. And that was a great step, you know, for our program. When you're trying to build something, you need some of those building blocks of success to gain the confidence of the players, the fans, the administration, you know, all those things. And that game, I thought, was a really big one for us. And for me early on, uh, for our program, um, and we kind of gained some respect, I think, around the league and then also around the country. Coach, you know, I'm here in the Memphis area, Penny Hardway's course at University of Memphis, and he made a statement a couple of years ago talking about some head coaches have problems with NBA guys like me being head coach. They don't like us. And I thought that was so far-fetched. And I was like, I'm not buying that for a second. It's okay. You could tell me I'm wrong. My wife tells me I'm wrong every day. But (laughs) (laughs) is that something out there? I know there's jealous people, and I'm sure there are some coaches out there that think that. But what do – head coaches think about former NBA guys coaching at the collegiate level? Well, first of all, I think that uh, there's a lot of ways to become a head coach. You know, some guys are promoted up and, and from assistants. Mm-hmm. Some guys have coached in high school. Some guys, you know, like I was started as a graduate assistant in college. And there's no playbook on how you, how you have to get there. And You take guys like Penny, uh, Juwan Howard at Michigan mm-hmm. right now. Those guys had so much success playing. But I think the thing that they forget, people forget about uh, guys like that, they were also coached by great coaches. Right. So they learned a lot. You know, Penny, you know, not only was he a great player, but you talk about and the experiences he had from high school to college to the NBA and things that he that he learned along the way and things that he picked up along the way, just like Juwan Howard. There's other guys like that. Um, Mo Williams, who played for me. Uh, Mm -hmm. at Alabama is now the head coach at Jackson State and you know even though Mo was an assistant for me for a couple years out here uh, in California you know he's a a player that he brings so much to the table because of all the guys he's played for you talk about guys in the NBA legends like Jerry Sloan you know Mo played for him in um, Utah Mm -hmm. and then you go through all these guys that he played for and 
So those guys bring a level of experience a lot of times that sometimes college coaches maybe haven't seen or done. So maybe it's a little bit of jealousy. I've never felt that way. I think that uh, I've got great respect for those guys because of what they did as players and what they learned from great coaches as players. So I think all in all, you know, there's a lot of ways to get there. And um, it's a hard job. I don't care if you've been a pro, a high school coach, or however you get there. Those jobs are difficult. And uh, those guys have done a great job. So, Coach, let's move to the 2000 and 2001 season. You finished that season 25 and 11 with a very deep run in the NIT championship. Walk us through what you remember about that deep run in the NIT back in 2001. Well, the first thing was we were just devastated that we didn't get in the NCAA tournament. I think that wow. year it kind of came down, maybe the last one or two or three teams picked, it was us in Georgia. And actually, Jim Herrick was coaching at Georgia at the time. And we had beat Georgia head up. And so we were we were really bothered by that. And I'll tell you what happened. I, I really didn't pay attention as the head coach early on to – the whole uh, strength of schedule concept. And, and we kind of rolled through those early, you know, December games and our schedule wasn't really that good. We had a couple of really tough teams, but just didn't really pay attention uh, that much at the time. So we felt we got snubbed. We, we felt like we should have been in the tournament. We didn't get in the NCAA tournament. So we went to the NIT and then I was really proud of our guys. You know, we made it all the way to the championship game, but the, of the NIT, and what people uh, may not remember is, you know, we had four freshmen uh, starting for us at that time. So I knew we had a chance to be good in the next couple of years. We started the four freshmen. We made it all the way to uh, New York City there and got beat by a senior laden team. I think Tulsa it was. And uh, they were all juniors and seniors, a little bit older than we were. But it was really the kind of a stepping stone that we needed for then the next year. Because the next year we had all those guys coming back, plus we added Mo Williams, who was the national became the national freshman of the year, and he was the best point guard in America. Right. So that year uh, going to the NIT was actually a really important year for us. It was it was a good year uh, because we needed that success and we needed some postseason, and and we felt like I said we felt snubbed, like we should have been in the tournament, and. Uh, that was really a bother for us. So I think our guys kind of galvanized that, and they got going and played really well in the NIT. Coach, we always hear about the coaching fraternity and how all you guys are close and this and that. But back during your days in the SEC, who were some of your good friends in the coaching ranks as far as head coaches in basketball? So here's what you have to remember. That's a great question, by the way. I get the job at Alabama, and I had just turned 33 years old. I I was 32 years old. I, I just turned 33. Now I'm made the head coach. And I'm looking down the road, and Cliff Ellis has Auburn. People forget this. They were on the cover of Sports Illustrated, preseason number one, mm -hmm. by the way. And uh, so I got Cliff Ellis over this way, Rick Stansberry over at Mississippi State. I got John Brady down at LSU. <laughs> Tubby Smith was at Kentucky. Billy Donovan was at Florida. Nolan Richardson was at Arkansas. And I can go on and on through the league now. And and I'm a young guy looking around at these guys that have coached and been really good and successful. And I'm thinking, how in the heck are we going to catch all these people? And uh, because not only were they good coaches, they were already somewhat established. You know, Nolan had been in two, you know, won the national championship right. at Arkansas and then, you know, got to the championship game when, when our UCLA team beat him. But uh, you know, that was a little bit of a daunting task, you know, to look around the league at that point in time. Um, Cliff Ellis had recruited me uh, when I was in high school. You know, he was at South Alabama at the time, and obviously we, I knew Cliff really well. I had played against Billy Donovan in college, uh, and then we were assistants. I was at UCLA, and Billy was at Kentucky, and so we had kind of, mm -hmm. you know, gotten after each other from recruiting battles. So I knew everybody, but I was trying to cut my teeth. And that's a tough league to cut your teeth in with those guys uh, all around you. So here's what happens in coaching. You compete really hard against each other. Uh, John Brady and I used to go at it where we were, we became enemies. And, uh, you know, we about fist fought a couple of times. And then Rick Stansberry and I, we wanted to slug each other too while we were coaching against each other. But then when you get older, you kind of realize, look, you're making pretty good money. I'm making pretty good money. Uh, we're all good. 
how about we all just get along? Can we just hold hands and sing Kumbaya? And we, we kind of, you kind of get to a point as a coach where you do that. And uh, those guys now, later in life, it's kind of funny because there's so much mutual respect uh, back and forth with uh, those coaches and the guys you've battled with that, uh, you know, I don't really have any ill feelings or ill, ill relationships with anybody. They're all pretty good. I see John Brady from time to time and, uh, Rick and Cliff and you know all these guys. So anyway, you end up later in life be, be, because there's so much respect. Everybody knows how hard those jobs are. That uh, you know you're going at, after each other with a switchblade while you're coaching, but then later <laughs> in life you kind of hug and make up and become friends. Coach, I got to squeeze this in real quick. Looking back, back during those times, who was the biggest jerk that you coached again? <laughs> was it Brady? Was it Stansberry? Because you and Stansberry had some classic battles in recruiting and on the court, but you mentioned Brady. But who was the guy that really got under your skin that you really just wanted to knock out? Pro probably John Brady. It's funny because we've talked about it and <laughs> laughed about it uh, later in life. But uh, we kind of got to a point one time where we said, look, you just stay in recruit Louisiana. I'll just stay in Alabama and we'll be good. <laughs> but um, – Probably John, you know, he had such good teams and such great players. He's such a really good coach. But, you know, we got grumpy at each other a few times. And then, you know, obviously Rick and I got real grumpy at each other. And, and that, but you know what? It, it ended up being a lot of fun. And uh, later on in life, you know, we've talked about things and laughed about things. And so uh, it's all good in the end. So, Coach, hold that thought because we are up against our final break. And when we come back, we are going to dive into the number one season right there for the Alabama Crimson Tide. That's on the other side of the break. You're listening to the Stingray Show. We will be right back. Are you guys in the mood for community goods and great barbecue? That's what you'll find at the Coker Market, located in Coker, Alabama, at the four-way intersection off of County Road 140. Their hours of operation are Wednesday through Saturday, 11 a.m. until 7 p.m., and their menu items include the Midnight, which is smoked ham, smoked pork, Swiss cheese, Creole mustard, mayonnaise, and a pickle, grilled on French bread. That sandwich is absolutely amazing. Make sure you go and check out the Coker Market right there at the four-way intersection in Coker for amazing food and community goods. Welcome back, SEC fans. You're listening to Tide 100.9. We have a very special guest with us tonight. Coach Mark Godfrey is with us. Coach, I got this fun question for you, and, and I think I know the answer, but I hope there's a story there. If there's not, we'll move on. But I got a great feeling you guys don't interact too much with play-by-play uh, play -play, uh, announcers over the years. Uh, with that, the great... Uh, Jack Crystal, the late Jack Crystal from Mississippi State, who announced for 56, 58 years, whatever it was in Starkville, made a statement during one of your classic battles between you and Rick Stansberry. And you guys won the game there in Coleman Coliseum. And at the very last second, you went in for a dunk. One of your players went in for a dunk. And the game had already been decided. And, and all of a sudden, you know, they said, well, that's not really a classy thing. And Jack Crystal, in his crotchety old age, loses it. He goes, who said they got class at all? This whole place is classless. This whole bunch is classless. And he just went on a tirade as the buzzer went off. And I know Mississippi State fans laughed and laughed and laughed about that. And I heard the Alabama fans, when they got worried about it, laughed as well. Did you ever hear that story or have any run-ins with the late Jack Crystal? I never had any run-ins. But here's what's funny about that, again, as time goes on. You know, when you're in the heat of the battle, you know, he was a homer, first of all. He oh, was yeah. A, he was a homer for his team, which is a good thing. I like that, you know, when you got your guy on the radio going to bat for you. But uh, I think comments like that, things like that, they made that rivalry so much better. You know, the yeah. fans got into that game so much. We'd go over there, and that place was packed. And they'd come to Tuscaloosa packed. You couldn't find a seat in uh, Coleman Coliseum. So 
you know, those kind of things, you know, you kind of laugh them off. I never heard that, that he said that or never, I'm not familiar with, but <laughs> I'm sure but, it's on uh, YouTube if you want to look at it. I know he was such, he was such a great voice for, for uh, Mississippi state. He was kind of a legend there for a long time. So when you're a legend, you get, you get to say some things that sometimes other people <laughs> don't get to say. Oh. So, so coach, I do want to go back to the 2002 and 2003 season, you helped guide that Alabama team to its first number one overall ranking in program history and kept it there for a full two weeks. Coach, what was that ride like, first getting them there and then keeping them there for two weeks at number one? You know, it was a lot of fun, and uh, we ended up being a uh, you know a one seed, I think, in the term that year, maybe a two seed. I think we were a two seed, but you know, the year started off. Uh, we opened up in uh, Madison Square Garden in New York City. I think we were ranked fifth in the country. Oklahoma was third in the country, and uh, you're playing in the Garden, which you know I've coached uh, a number of teams in Madison Square Garden. Of uh, it's there's nothing like it. You know, you you feel like walking into that arena. The whole world is watching, you know, in the garden. So that's how that year started. And, uh, you know, then we became number one right before Christmas. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to be very honest about this one. I haven't told this story a lot of times, but I'm going to tell you guys. So you. I think we had played Moorhead State like on December, you know, 21st or 22nd. And we had, you know, those couple days off, you know, during the Christmas holidays. Right. And I remember uh, waking up on Christmas morning thinking, we're ranked number one in the country, you know, first time ever. It's Christmas Day. What a Christmas present that is. How about that? And at the same time, Alabama, I want to say if I have this right, I think they were going to play in the uh, Pool Inn Weed Eater Bowl in Shreveport, Louisiana. I think we were six and six in football. And uh, they're going to play, I want to say, Iowa State maybe. And uh, it was just one of those games, two six and six teams, you know, playing in a bowl game. But I remember the Tuscaloosa newspaper. I woke up there and I opened the paper and I'm trying to find a story about our basketball team. I couldn't find one in the paper. Right. We were like on page seven of the sports because it was wow. all football. And I remember I got grumpy. I was really grumpy. Like we're number one in the country and I can't find it. We're on page seven right now, you know, and it was a reminder of how big <laughs> Alabama football was. Right. Uh, but it was such a great thing for the program. I think that, the recognition, the note, you know, the notoriety around the country. It gave Alabama basketball, which had had success in the past, but it gave us a lot of respect around the country. People looked at us a little bit differently when you're ranked number one. Then we had to go play at University of Utah. They had come to Tuscaloosa the year before, and we beat them pretty bad the year before. Rick Majerus, the great coach, was, was their coach, and we had to go to Salt Lake City there right after Christmas. And, uh, you know, they, they just beat us up out there and, and manhandled us. We got right to the wire. We had a shot to win it. Mo Williams had a had a good look at the basket. I think we were down one and we just missed the shot. But, um, you know, when you're number one, people come after you a little differently now, even yeah, than when do. you're number two. And everybody <laughs> wants to beat the number one team. It's a feather in their cap. So when you're number one, uh, you got to bring your A game. And, uh, you know, it was a great thing, I think, for Alabama basketball. Coach, looking back uh, at your coaching career there at Alabama, what was the hardest place you ever had to go on the road and play? Was it Kentucky? Was it – what was one place you always dreaded going? And you could say more than one. That's a that's a great question. You know, we had taken, uh, I think, a couple teams into Rupp. Uh, when, you, when you win in Rupp Arena, it's like a church. The, at the end of the game, it's so quiet in there. You know, they don't know what to do. And uh, – you know, we had been in Rupp and, and won a couple of times, which was great. But I always thought the toughest environment when I was coaching was Florida. Billy okay. Donovan had that place rocking and rolling. You know, they'd won the back-to-back -back, uh, uh, national championships. Mm -hmm. Their student section was, you know, end line to end line, you know, probably 15, 20 rows up across the court. Uh, the bleachers are come right behind you. and they, they almost, you, know, you have knees hitting you in the back, you know, while you're sitting on the bench. And uh, it was a tough environment to go win at Florida. One, his teams were good. They were, you know, amazingly talented players. But that environment – and then I always thought this one. I always thought Vanderbilt was hard. Right. And I have always felt – and I've said this out loud many times. Uh, I don't know how they allow 
the benches to be uh, uh, underneath the basket. I was about to ask America. that. And, you know, they went through a renovation, and I would have thought when they renovated uh, that, that building that they would have moved the benches to the sides and found mm -hmm. a way to do it. But uh, I think that's a tremendous advantage for the home team. They play, uh, they play with that setup every home game where your visitors come in once a year and you're right. having to coach from behind the basket. It would be like telling Nick Saban, you got to go stand underneath the goalpost and, and coach your team. <laughs> And the actions on the other end of the field, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's interesting. So I've always felt Vanderbilt uh, was hard, but Florida, Billy Donovan, what they had going on during that era in Florida was just amazing. Their home court advantage was off the charts. So, Coach, let's move to the 2003-2004 season. You guys made the deepest run in program history all the way to the Elite Eight. And in order to do that, you guys had to knock off the number one seed, Stanford, that year, 70-67. to Coach, how wild of a game and an upset was that for you guys? Well, it was amazing. You know, we played Southern Illinois in the eight seed versus nine seed game as the first game. And uh, Antoine Petway, who we all love dearly, uh, made a great, great little floater shot uh, right in the lane. So we, we got past Southern Illinois and, and uh, Stanford was 30 and one. They were the number one of the number one seeds. And uh, I can remember late in the game, probably about two and a half minutes to go in the game, they had a great player named Josh Childress. And Josh Childress picked up an offensive charging foul, and uh, which was his fourth foul. And Mike Montgomery, the head coach at Stanford, was arguing with the referee, and they didn't like the call. And the, we inbound the ball, and Josh Childress is still in the game with four fouls. And the very next trip down, I mean, right seconds later, the ball is right in front of our bench. Kennedy Winston, who is such a good player, He's got Josh Childers on him right in front of our bench, and we all stand up, take him, just take him, no matter what, just go to the <laughs> basket, you know. And so Kennedy drove it and picked up Josh Fielder's fifth foul. He's out of the game. Yeah. And I think when that happened, all of a sudden, our guys, uh, you could see in, in, the, 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 uh, in our guys' eyes, uh-oh, we got a chance now, and, and we're going to win this game. And, uh, you know, we were able to finish it out there, and uh, that was such a – a uh, great win. It was in Seattle, Washington there at the old Key Arena. I think they've actually torn that building down maybe now. But anyway, what a magnificent run. Then, you know, we, we get to play Syracuse, who's, uh, you know, defending national champions. And uh, we were able to get by them. And then we had to play the great – that team, UConn, that year was so good. They had just been beating everybody like a drum that year. But uh, it was such a great run. It was a lot of fun. and. Uh, we had such resilient guys. I mean, uh, we were not a great, great team, but they were great together. And they really played well at the end of the year is what you always want as a coach. Coach, looking back to one of your uh, – uh, let me start that over, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Coach, looking back at your career, there's one game that uh, I remember uh, specifically. It was a Mississippi State game. I want to say – uh, uh, being first in the West was on the line. It might have been the SEC regular season tournament. Yes. Timmy B., who's a regular on the show, Tim Brando, uh, was doing that game. And, you know, I have not asked Timmy about this. Uh, maybe I should after we talk to you. But late in the game, there was a free throw being getting ready to attempt by Alabama, and a Mississippi State player comes in late uh, to the free throw line and asked to come in. And, and the shooter was a little bit off, and Tim Brando had a meltdown. You're like, you can't do that. You can't do that. And I was like, uh, my first thought was like, it's it's a free throw. It's not like it's contested. It's a free throw. Yeah. I mean, I know he's trying to play head games and mind games. I'm not doubting that whatsoever. But what was your thought during that? Did that fly over you? Or, or are you kind of like me? It's like, hey, it's a free throw. Just get your composer, shoot it. Or come on, you can't let him do that. You know, that's wrong. I mean, what was your reaction to that situation? And, and you, you know, your feelings about that whole thing? Well, it was really unfortunate. It was a good referee, too. I can't remember exactly what it was, but I remember it was a really – it was a seasoned ref. But what happened as well is uh, the referee had handed Ernest Shelton the ball. And as a free-throw shooter, you get into a little bit of a rhythm. You know, the right. ref hands you the basketball. It's one or two bounce. You know, every, every player has something a little bit different. So Ernest already had the ball 
and then their player, I think, stepped out off the lane, and the referee stepped in and grabbed the ball away from Ernest. And you're talking about, too, a situation where for a young player, college player, you know, game is on the line. I think there was – we were down to the last few seconds. And uh, I thought it really threw Ernest off. And, uh, okay. uh, you know, he actually kind of looked at the referee like, well, wait, what, what are you doing? You know, like you, you can't – you know, once you hand me the ball, you can't just take it back from me on the foul line uh, without a whistle. It was really a lane violation as well. But, right. um, you know, for a player, it just kind of – it screws your rhythm up. And now as a coach, what I'm trying to do, even though in my gut – I'm furious. I was absolutely furious. I wanted to strangle that guy. But at the same time, um, I want Ernest to be calm on the line and have confidence. And so I didn't want to just blow up over there and, and create, you know, more of a scene because the most important thing was is to make sure the foul shooter was comfortable, which was Ernest Shelton. And he ended up missing the foul shot. It was it was a big play. And uh, it was just one of those kind of strange you know, kind of unique things that might happen at the end of the game. And uh, uh, I'm looking at the referee right now, and I can't think of his name. He was actually refed in the NBA for a long time. But anyway, uh, later, you know, uh, down the road, games later, you know, I remember that official coming up to me and saying, man, I feel so bad. Like, you know, it was just one of those things. It wasn't intentional. It wasn't an intentional thing. It just kind of happened. But uh, it definitely – it definitely – you know, probably got into Ernest's head a little bit, and, and uh, he ended up not making the foul shot, and it was pivotal. We lost that game. With you saying that the referee apologized, that tells me everything right there. Yeah. That he knew that, looking back, he knew that he messed that up, and yep. he thinks that, you know, it determined the game. That's amazing. I'm glad that you shared that with us. Mm-hmm. Well, ref- referees are your human beings, too. Right. And- you know, those guys, uh, I used to joke and kid around. Uh, this was a line I had that every, you know, guys didn't like. But I used to say that, you know, guys in the media and referees are the two most sensitive people on the planet Earth other than w- our wives. <laughs> but uh, anyway, the uh, the officials, uh, they're guys too, you know. And you know what? They're doing their best. They really are. They make mistakes. We get grumpy at them. You know, we yell and, and you know, act like we're – crazy and and we are at the times it's very intense but when the dust settles and the game ends uh you know there's been places i've been out on the road recruiting and you know you bump into guys and referees and and most of them are just really good people and they're doing they're trying their best too and so things happen we all make mistakes coaches make them players make them referees make them and life moves on so, Coach, I do want to ask you about one of the craziest situations I have ever seen in a basketball game, and unfortunately, you were a part of it. Let's move to the 2008 season and another Mississippi State game in the SEC tournament in Atlanta when a tornado hit downtown Atlanta and the Georgia Dome. Coach, if you could, please walk us through that entire chaotic situation. Well, that's another one that you'll live in a lifetime and never have anything like that happen before. Yes. But, you know, back in the SEC tournament, we played in the in the Dome there in Atlanta. And, uh, you know, it was overtime. Uh, you know, Mikhail Riley had hit a shot. We were down three and had a side out of bounds. And we ran out of bounds play and got Mikhail Riley uh, a shot in the corner. And he, he made the three which we later learned that if he had missed that shot and people would have exited the arena, they would have walked, they'd have been walking outside into a, in the midst of a tornado. But you know, the tornado rolled through downtown Atlanta when it went over the top of the dome, it sounded like a train, like a train track, you know, like a train is going over the top and you're trying to figure out what was that? Like, what, what is that noise? It was loud. It was, it was like uh, just unusual. You didn't, what, you know, we didn't know what it was. And uh, they stopped the game. And I can remember there were bolts uh, that were dropping from, if you imagine how high the ceiling was in the dome there, and there's little uh, nuts and bolts that were kind of up there somewhere. They were dropping and hitting the floor. And so we were all kind of trying to figure it out. And I think, you know, they cleared the, uh, the court pretty quickly. We went to the locker room. Um, I think we stayed in the locker room for about an hour and 20 minutes. It, it was a mm. long time. And, it's an overtime game in the tournament. Yeah. So you got to finish the game. And then the other thing that was really interesting about that, we had a really good player named Alonzo G and Alonzo G had just gotten fouled. 
And I want to say we might have been down by two. He gets fouled on a one-and-one one with a chance to tie it. And uh, he's got to sit in the locker room for an hour and 20 minutes before he shoots the front end of his one-and-one. One. Right. And so when we resume play, we finally come back out to play. We, we start play back up with him on the line on a foul shot. Right. <laughs> and, you know, he misses the front end where, you know, maybe in the flow of it, maybe – you know, he'd had a better chance to make two foul shots, and then the game is tied. Well, we missed the front end. They come down. I think they hit a three. Now they're up five, and, you know, it's a different game in overtime. Right. But it was the uh, it's the most unusual, strange uh, thing I've ever been a part of in sports. I've never seen anything like that. And right. then if people remember correctly, they canceled the next game that night, which was yeah. Georgia and Kentucky. Yeah, And then Georgia had to play two games in the same day on the following day because the SEC had to finish the tournament by Sunday uh, right. for the for the automatic bid. So that tornado was a uh, games in the tournament in the tournament. And so anyway, it was a uh, it was completely weird and strange to, to go through something like that. Mm. That is crazy. You know, go to we're not, we're not going to pass the offering plate and seeing come as I am. But do you feel like that was divine intervention uh, of that shot going through and, and not getting fouled, hitting that three-pointer of people not going outside in that tornado? I mean, I just kind of look at that, you know, because there's no reason whatsoever that shot should have ever got off, the, you know, taken. But you just feel like it was divine intervention that God kind of stepped in, like, okay, make this shot. We're going to keep everybody safe and, you know. But then you, you might feel robbed because you still didn't win the game. <laughs> well, no, I, I I agree with you. I've always felt that way because mm -hmm. uh, what happened was we left the uh, we left the uh, arena later that evening. Obviously, it was late at night. Now it's probably mm -hmm. eleven thirty or something. Eleven eleven thirty at night by the time we get out of there, and even our bus as we drove around the dome, you know, getting out of there, heading back to the hotel, the destruction. In downtown Atlanta, there was cars upside down. There was windows mm. smashed out, <clears throat> street signs down. You know, it looked like a bomb had went off outside of the uh, dome in wow. Atlanta. And uh, so the first thought you had, even though we lost, we were disappointed. My, my first thought even that night when I, we got on the bus and I could see outside the dome, I just said, thank God. Just thank you, Lord, that the uh, you there's no telling uh, the possibility of what could have happened to people if they would have walked out of that arena, you know, for, or, you know, an hour and a half earlier or whenever that was, or maybe not even that long at the time, if you would have missed the shot, they would have been outside, but it, it was, it would have been tragic. So yes, I do agree with you on that one. Wow. Coach, I've got four questions left for you and then we'll get out of here. The first one is, after your tenure at Alabama, you were hired by North Carolina State back in 2011. And to hype that upcoming basketball season, you had planned to perform a tandem skydive into Carter Finley Stadium during a halftime of a football game, but it was canceled due to weather. Whose idea was that, and do you regret not having that opportunity to skydive into the stadium? Well, it was somebody in the uh, marketing department's idea, so I went along with it. Here's the crazy part. Uh, my kids can give me grief all the time because I'm afraid of heights. How about that one? I'm, I'm not comfortable up high. So <laughs> right. next thing you know, uh, they, they canceled that one, and the reason they did was the, the pitch – I guess on a tandem, you, you have to come in at a certain angle and uh, to get inside the stadium uh, in a tandem situation. So what we did, we changed it. I still I still jumped out of the plane. We did a – but they had to tape it, and uh, we kind of made it look like I was coming in for midnight madness. But uh, it's one thing to talk about uh, skydiving. It's another thing when your feet are dangling outside of the plane and you're looking down <laughs> from 12,000 feet. And uh, saying, am I actually going to leave this airplane right now and, and, uh, and skydive? But it ended up being a lot of fun. They did some fun stuff there at NC State. One year they had me on a zip line from the top of the arena all the way down to midcourt on, on Midnight Madness. So anyway, we, we had a blast with some of those fun things like that. You know, Coach, the national media, the the, the Timmy B's, uh, Dick Vitale, you know, whoever – do you enjoy when those guys come around and talk to – what are your conversations about? Are they strictly about basketball and the game, or is it 
just the opposite. They don't hardly ever want to talk about basketball and everything else. You know, it's interesting because a lot of those guys, you know, you become mm-hmm. friends with over time. And uh, like Timmy Brando, I had him on my podcast, you know, CoachMarkGodfrey.com, the front row. You guys all got to well, check definitely. it out. But Timmy, you know, I've known Tim Brando. You know, he covered me as a player, then as a coach. You know, he's from Shreveport, Louisiana. We would get together and play golf a lot of times in the mm-hmm. offseason. We'd play down in Alabama, or I would go to his uh, – he had a, a, a – fundraising event there in uh, Shreveport with David Toms mm-hmm. and uh, Hal Sutton. Um, and then, you know, I, obviously, I've, you know, I've been to Dick Vitale's home. You know, he has a big gala where he raised a lot of money for cancer. So you, you become mm-hmm. friends uh, also uh, with a lot of those guys. And, and then there are also people in the media, too, that, you know, you get a little grumpy at from time to time. And uh, we, we're not probably exchanging right. Christmas gifts uh, after over the course of time. But that's just kind of part of life. Uh, again, those guys have a job to do. Um, I've always thought Tim Brando was one of the best there, there ever, you know, has been, uh, he's a survivor. He's probably worked for every network, uh, that's been on television known to man and he's done every kind of sport. Um, then I had the opportunity to, you know, I worked at ESPN for two years in between Alabama and NC state. So all those guys up there and the Stuart Scott's and the, uh, they're all those guys, you know, Reese Davis, who went to Alabama, mm-hmm. they just become buddies. They become your buddy and your friend. And uh, most of those guys treat the coaches pretty fairly and pretty honestly um, throughout the years. And so, uh, you know, but again, time, uh, you know, makes it to where you have good relationships, hopefully with a lot of those people. So, Coach, getting back to your NC State days, on January the 23rd of 2017, you earned your 400th career career win as a head coach by defeating number 17 Duke at Cameron Indoor Stadium. What did it mean to you to get your 400th career win? Well, it was probably, you know, throughout your career, you got these markers, you know, these highlights. That was definitely one of them. Uh NC State hadn't won a game inside Cameron Indoor Stadium at Duke in 26 years. Mm -hmm. And so to win that game, it was really special. Um, My dad, who's now turning 84 this year, was at that game. That was really special for him to be there uh, and watch that game. And I'm going to tell you guys an interesting thing. So, So about a week after that game, I go to my mailbox and I open up this package. It's coming from the Detroit Pistons. And I'm not trying to figure out what this is. And so I open it up and I've got this Detroit Pistons jersey, game jersey. And on the back is my name with the number 400 on it. And I'm thinking, wow, I've got a letter from Stan Van Gundy, the head coach at the Pistons at the time. And I knew Stan a little bit. And uh, he had a letter congratulating, you know, me. And it just meant so much. And and, you know, Stan and his brother, Jeff Van Gundy, their, their dad was a, a basketball coach, and they understand how hard coaching yeah. is. And so, you know, a lot of times when coaches would have a milestone win, Stan Van Gundy would reach out with some special gift. I, I thought it was one of the coolest things ever um, that he sent me this Detroit Pistons jersey. And he didn't realize and didn't know it. But, you know, in 87, when I played at Alabama, I got drafted by the Pistons. And so anyway, I ended up framing the jersey and I've got the letter from when I got drafted and I've got Stan's letter uh, there all in a frame. It's really, it's really beautiful. But that win was a, uh, you know, that's one you never forget. That's, that's a hard place to play. Uh, It's a hard place to take a team. Mm -hmm. Um, Probably one of the two or three best basketball environments in the country, period. And to take a team in there and beat them was uh, really special. Wow. So coach, Looking back at your entire coaching career, what is one thing that you wished you would have had the opportunity to experience but never got that opportunity? That's a great, great question. And, uh, you know, our team at Alabama, you know, went to the Elite Eight. We were 40 minutes away from the Final Four. Um, and they're bringing that team back on February 17th. It'll be fun to, to, to see everybody in Tuscaloosa there. They're going to honor that team at halftime, I think, uh, on the 17th of February. But, uh, you know, what I wanted to do more than anything, anything at Alabama, my alma mater, you know, I played there. I wanted to take Alabama to the Final Four. That, that, that was all I thought about every day. I wanted to win a national championship. I wanted Alabama to be in the Final Four. And I can remember uh, the year we went to the Elite Eight, you know, you wake up that morning and we got Connecticut, 
who, by the way, was really, really good. They had smoked everybody in, in the tournament that year and won the national championship. But I just remember saying, man, we're 40 minutes away. Right. We're 40 minutes away from Alabama basketball uh, being in the Final Four. I'd grown up going to Final Fours. My dad was a high school and small college basketball coach, and I loved the Final Four. And, uh, you know, we were just knocking on the door, but we didn't get right. there. And so – you know, throughout my whole coaching career, that's one of those things that uh, I, I never got done that I wanted to. Mm -hmm. And I really wanted to do it at Alabama yes. uh, because that was my alma mater. Wow. Well, Coach, none of us get to pick our neighbors. Well, hardly any of us get to pick our neighbors. But if you could pick a coach to live on either side of you, who would you pick and why? Would it be someone funny? Would it be someone you respected or just someone that's just a nice guy that would stay out of your hair and not give you any trouble? Who would, well, who are the two guys tough, you would pick and a, why? That's a great question, but, uh, that's a tough one. Um, I don't know, you know, coaches get grumpy now. We, we, we're moody, you know, I'd have, I'd have moody neighbors if that was the right. case. Uh, but I tell you guys that I've respected throughout the years for a lot of reasons, you know, obviously I worked with Jim Harris. Right. He was amazing. And I, and I, you know, Wimp Sanderson, I, I loved playing for, for coach Sanderson, right. but you know, I always had throughout the years so much respect for Jim Beheim. Okay. Uh, he was a guest on my podcast as well. If somebody wants to go back and listen to his episode, it's a great one with Jim Beheim. but I've always respected him, um, because I've always felt, uh, Jim Beheim is probably one of the most authentic people. Mm -hmm. um, you don't always like what he says, but you know whatever he says, it's how he really feels. Mm -hmm. there, there's no there's no BS with him. I, I, I've always enjoyed that about him. I enjoyed, I enjoyed coaching against him uh, a number of times. And so he would be somebody that, uh, you know, that I, I have a good relationship with him, but always uh, just admired him, you know, so much. And then, you know, during my time at um, – NC State, you know, I had great respect for Roy Williams. Yeah. Uh, you know, I had known Roy uh, pretty well throughout the years, you know, being an assistant at UCLA and coach in different places. And uh, I've always felt he was one of the most underappreciated coaches, uh, you know, there ever has been. You know, what he did at Kansas and then what he did at Carolina. And he always treated me with, uh, with uh, great respect and he was – always cordial and professional and friendly. So, um, you know, I, I, even though I had to compete against him and, you know, you, you butt heads, um, I just always had great respect for him as well. Wow. So coach, two questions left. The first one, since your time as coach of Alabama, please describe for us how much the game of basketball has evolved. Well, it's changed a lot. And uh, there are some parts about the college game I like and some parts that, you know, I'm, I, I sound like one of these old codgers now that, you know, <laughs> you, you moan and groan about what it used to be like. But a lot of people in basketball, it happens in the NBA as well, too. Now, they, they offensively, they run the same things. And, uh, you know, it's a ball screen offense and the creativity. I think back in the, the older days, there was so every coach was so unique. Every game you played was completely different, a completely different style. And what teams ran offensively, and I think now it, it blends together right. a little bit. The, the other part about college athletics right now is the whole NIL and the portal thing, you know, the, the name, image, and likeness. Um, you know, I've got – I'm glad that players are able to receive some compensation mm -hmm. if they if – they, if they can, if, if the market demands it. I don't like the fact that every player basically now has an expectation to get paid one way or another through NIL and through a collective or from some, some place. I just don't think that's what college athletics is really all about. So um, I've got some real issues with that. Mm -hmm. I think the NCAA, when they, they combine the, the, the opportunity for kids to make money through name, image, and likeness, and then the transfer portal at the exact same time, it really created a lot of chaos. The game will survive. It's going to be okay. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, there's a ton of chaos. I think the uh, kids bouncing around from team to team and all that, I'm not sure I'm a big fan of that without having to sit out. Uh, now they can transfer twice, I think, without having to sit out. It's like pro sports with no contract. Right. It's, it's like 
it's like the NBA and the NFL or Major League Baseball having no contracts. Mm -hmm. Every player is a free agent every year. And I just don't know that that in the long run, that's healthy for the game. But I'm still a fan. I still watch everything. And um, but it's definitely a lot different than it was when I played or even when I coached there at Alabama. Yes. So, Coach, my final question for you is simply this. Here at Alabama, who was the absolute best basketball player that you ever coached and why? <laughs> that's a, that's a, you're walking me into one there now because I had such great players. If I name one player, I'm going to have about 20. They're going to be grumpy at me, so i got to be real careful here. I had so many great players. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mentioned Mo Williams. You know, he was the national freshman of the year uh, play for us. Irwin Dudley was the SEC player of the year and probably one of the greatest people, just people you'll ever be around. Um, Talent-wise, Kennedy Winston was really oh, up yeah. there high. Uh, didn't play in the NBA, but what a player. And probably the most talented guy that if we all just got together, we were really honest with each other. All of our players during my, you know, 11 years there. Uh, Talent-wise, Rod Grizzard was probably up there. You're talking about a six-foot-eight wing player that could shoot, and he's athletic. And uh, I loved, I just, to this day, I love him. And, uh, you know, he had an injury there uh, right uh, before the draft where he tore, men tore his meniscus in his knee, and he never really panned out in the NBA. But what a great college, uh, player and college talent he was. But you know, I coach so many good players. Um, I can't, I'm not going to, I'm not, I'm not going into that one where I get to pick one. I'm going to refrain yes. from that. Okay. There's a bunch I'll of make good it, ones. I'll make it easier on you, coach. Who was the one player that got away from you recruiting wise that if you had him, he would have taken you to the next level. He'd have got you that final four, whatever I it think might when, be. When I was at, when I was at Alabama, uh, and there's a lot of stories, and we ought to write a book about this one, Dave. It's probably Mario Austin, who who was from mm -hmm. uh, just over there in West Alabama. He went to Mississippi State, and uh, that's the same era when we had those really good teams, the 2002, you know, uh, right. Mo Williams, kind of that right after that, that little bit of era right there. And, uh, you know, that one broke my heart, you know, that we didn't we mm -hmm. didn't have Mario there with us because uh, we felt strongly that in the state of Alabama coach there, uh, our philosophy was we're going to build a wall around the state on the on the state line yeah. and no one's coming in. Nobody's coming in to get a player. North Carolina tried to get Richard Hendricks and Duke tried to get Gerald Wallace and and we weren't going to let that happen. We were going to make sure the Alabama kids stayed home. And so when we lost Mario, he was probably mm -hmm. the guy looking back that, uh, you know, you'll put your head on the pillow at night thinking what in the world, you know, that, that one probably mm -hmm. stung more than any of them. Gotcha. Wow. Coach, my very last question is this. If you had to go against another coach and, and we walked into the YMCA and you were splitting up teams and you had a week to practice, Who's the one guy you don't want to coach against? Who was one guy that you just know he's going to have his team ready no matter what? Who's the one guy you don't want to coach against? So when I was coaching at NC State, you know, we had battles with uh, Tony Bennett at Virginia. And yeah. uh, we got there about the same time. I think maybe I, he might have been one year ahead of me. So we were both trying to get the programs established. But as Tony, uh, as his teams got better, there were times when you played against Virginia, when he had Malcolm Brogdon and Joe Harris and all these really good players who had great careers in the NBA, still playing some of those guys. There were times I felt we might not score a basket the whole game. Like we might get shut out tonight. It, it might be 56 to nothing. I mean, we they guarded wow. you so well, and uh, offensively they were so good that um, – you know, he was probably that guy that you you go to bed the night before the game thinking, I hope we could score a basket, just one, just one <laughs> basket the whole game. And uh, but he was uh, and still is to this day. I was so happy when he was able to win the national championship a few years back. But he would probably be that guy. Wow. So, Coach, look, man, we have thoroughly enjoyed you joining us. And if you would, please go on ahead and let everybody know where they can follow you on social media and especially let everybody know about that podcast, please. Well, the podcast is a lot of fun. Uh, they can go to www.coachmarkgodfrey.com. All the podcasts sit on there. They're on Spotify, Apple, Google, 
uh, YouTube. It's called The Front Row with Coach Mark Godfrey. We've had some fun, fun guests, uh, mostly sports guys, but some people outside of sports as well. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's been a lot of fun, and uh, it's actually blowing up right now. So I'm having a ball with it. But I'd love for people to uh, check it out and uh, see what they think. And, Coach, we look, forward, we look forward to having you back in Tuscaloosa on February the 17th. Enjoy that. Thank you guys so much. Appreciate it. All right. Coach, hey, Coach, join us anytime. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Thank you. Heath, I got to be honest with you. That was one of my favorite shows right there with Coach Mark Godfrey. Yeah, you know, anytime I, I ask a question and, he, you know, the our guest says, hey, that's a really good question. You know, Coach said that twice. So it, it seemed like Coach was having a lot of fun. He yes. shared a lot of laughs with us, a lot of great memories. He talked about his struggles and his successes. He talked about wins. He talked about losses. He talked about things on and off the court. If you missed any of this interview, check out the podcast. And I'm going to tell you a secret to everybody else. This podcast or this radio show went way long. We have to cut it down. There's going to be like an extra 40 to 50 minutes of material. And it's going to be dynamic. It is going to be amazing. So if you missed any of it, check it out on social media. Uh, We'll have it posted on our Facebook page. Uh, Stephen will tweet it out on X, you know, but check it out on Spotify or Apple Music, The Stingray Show. Coach Mark Godfrey hit a grand slam with this show today. And Heath, to piggyback off of that, we went an hour and 45 minutes with Coach. We can only put an hour worth of content on the radio, so 45 minutes of extra bonus content on that podcast. Yeah, it's going to be absolutely amazing. It'll be a podcast that you share with friends. It really will be.